Thank you, thank you very much, Simon. Hello, everybody. Yes, the session's called Alternative uh, Peer Review, but actually my contention is that the same principles, the same issues apply to all the new models that are coming up, and there are a new model, a lot of new models come up, as I have always applied to traditional publishing, traditional pe peer review, and I'm going to sort of be going through some of the things and that. I want to put one thing, misconception, to, to rest, which is you will hear people say, Open access doesn't have good peer review. It does. It's nothing to do um, with the business model, with the size of journal you are. It depends on the people. Good practice and quality in peer review is system and access and business model independent. And at the recent House of Lords um, inquiry into peer review, I was sitting at home in North, North Yorkshire watching it on the video, screaming, please, because again, this mis misconception came out. So let's dispel that. It's totally independent. Um, and in 2011, I was the specialist advisor to the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee for their inquiry into peer review and the resulting report. And this was stressed in it. We encourage increased recognition that peer review quality is independent of journal business model. For example, there is a misconception that open access somehow does not use peer review. Totally, totally wrong. What is peer review? And I'm going to call it, you'll hear it called editorial peer review, which is linked to journal peer review, but we're moving beyond journals now. So it's really the review of research outputs. And this is my own definition in, that I did for a book chapter last year. Peer review in scholarly publishing is the process by which research output is subjected to scrutiny and critical assessment by individuals who are experts in those areas. Scrutiny, scrutiny and critical assessment by experts. That's all it is. It's very simple and that is all it is. And the ICMJ um, have the definition which they say is by experts who are not part of the editorial staff. So it's peer review is review done by external people. This is a quote from David Cahoon, um, and it relates to the university assessment of work, but it totally applies to peer review. The only way to assess the merit of a paper is to ask a selection of experts in the field. Nothing else works, nothing. And I totally, totally agree with that. But why does peer review get such a bad press if it is such a simple thing? It's the opinion of experts. You think that this will be a wonderful thing because the value uh, of experts is, is very, very, the opinion of experts is very valuable. You'll see these kinds of things. The, when peer review is written about now, it's a topic of vigorous debate. You get very polarized views. Things like peer review is broken, peer review is in crisis, it's breaking down. And you'll see this, this image with it often. And these kinds of comments, these kinds of criticisms, it's unreliable, unfair, no clear standards, open to abuse, stifles innovation, those have been around for a long time, but they're much more visible nowadays because of the internet. They are all true. This does happen. It happens to some people sometimes in their lives because it's a human activity, so it will fail even in the best run systems. But it also happens for other reasons. People say it's expensive and labor intensive or whatever. There is a lot of effort put into it, but it is a very valuable process because it helps to stop research that is wrong, basically, from coming out. And I'm a great believer in some sort of pre-publication um, peer review. Reviewers overloaded working for free. It's a reciprocal process. Authors are reviewers are authors. And I know the journal I used to run, I was a managing editor for 20 years. Groups told us of groups they knew who submitted papers to our journal knowing they would be rejected because all they wanted was the reviewers' reports. That's the value they put on them at a good journal. And I've seen people online also saying they've done this to journals. Reviewers are overloaded, but that's part of the fault of the system. And publishers and new, new innovators are starting to use transfer of manuscripts because the same manuscript can get reviewed so, so many times. Um, and Keith Collier from rubric I think has put a value on it that annually that 15.6 million hours are wasted on reviews that go to rejected manuscript. That's scandalous. And the critical thing is the role of the editor. Now I've put this in quotes because it is known as the editor but it's more a role. It's a person who oversees the process, who has the wisdom, who has the knowledge, who has the expertise. And this is what is lacking in some of the new systems, because there are numerous, numerous systems, and people are reinventing the wheel, but there are incredibly good processes already in place. 
I'm going to just read you two quotes because these sum up a lot of the problems of the system. This was somebody who, um, a respondent in this very large peer review survey that was done in, uh, it was done in 2007, published in 2008. Peer review works as well as can be expected. The critical feature that makes the system work is the skill and insight of the editor. Astute editors can use the system well. The less able who follow review economists and critically bring the system into disrepute. And Dorothy Bishop at DVB on Twitter, who is at Oxford University, she put this comment on um, a Richard Smith um, blog. Unfortunately, all too often, editors relinquish their responsibilities and treat peer review process as a vote. The real problem is editors increasingly. One sees editors who don't use any judgment at all, but just keep going back to the reviewers until there's agreement. Editors have to act as editors. It's a complex process. Reviewers advise, editors make the decisions. And there are editors who just send everything out to reviewers. They send them manuscripts that the English isn't even comprehensible. They shouldn't be doing that. An editor's role is to say to an author, the reviewer said that you need to do this experiment, not that, you, to be discriminating. And there was a paper in Nature a few years ago, the tyranny of reviewer experiments. And the criti same criticism as this, the editors are just saying, do all the experiments and we'll accept the paper. Totally unacceptable. So there are problems. The quality of peer review is incredibly variable. There's inconsistency in decision making across journals. Part of the person who oversees a journal is to make sure that their editorial board are acting, acting consistently, implementing the right policies, and making decisions consistently. And that is difficult. It's time consuming. And this, the editors are not trained. I usually, because I talk to a lot of editors, I talk to a lot of researchers, and I usually ask people to put up their hands when I'm in the editors. How many of the editors have had training? Hardly ever a hand goes up. These are people who are hotshot researchers. One day they're just in the lab doing experiments. Next day they're making decisions on manuscripts, the kind of decisions that are going to affect the promotions, the grant funding of the people who have submitted those manuscripts without any training. You know, think about that. And we'll go on, peer reviewers aren't trained either, and yet they are advising the editors. And there is unethical behavior. Now, I've been in scholarly publishing for over 30 years, 20 years as managing editor, and I thought I'd seen everything. I have seen things that will make your hair curl, right? But last year, something happened which even I had never seen, the three cases of fake reviewers. Journals, editors, ask authors often to, su to submit suggested reviewers. I never use the word preferred. You'll see when you read about these cases, some people talk about preferred reviewers. It's very helpful, but editors make the same kind of decisions that they do on the others, the same, same kind of screening, looking at what they've written, how suitable are they, what conflicts do they have, because that is an incredibly important area. So these authors, they suggested people who they'd made up. They had false identities, false emails, and they went to them or their colleagues. Or they were the names of real people that created email accounts which they or their associates had access to. So they were acting as reviewers of their own papers. This was not found out until much later because suddenly uh, in one of the journals, the reviews were being very quickly done quickly and very positive as you'd expect. None of these papers were rejected. These papers were retracted and this is the retraction notice that appears on many of them. The peer review process for the above article was found to have been compromised and inappropriately influenced by the corresponding author. The author and his friends were reviewing their own manuscripts these papers are in the literature. Is this the tip of the iceberg? Because, and, and if anyone wants to go and look, if you go onto the Retraction Watch blog, there's a faked emails category, you'll be able to read about this. It's not an isolated case. It involves different disciplines, different countries, different publishers, and many papers. And this is one of the cases. This chap, um, he's had 35 um, papers retracted altogether, 28 because of faked reviewers. Papers have all been retracted, but when the, the guys uh, who run Retraction Watch went to him, he said to them, yeah, you know, um, it can be mistaken for fake reviews, but he said it wasn't only his mistake. The editors, Moon said, invited those reviews without confirming the identity of the reviewers. This is the bread and butter job of journals, editors, whoever is running all the new alternative kinds of peer review. You have to know who is reviewing the papers. It's a skill. We know that any editor can make any paper accepted by sending it to the right reviewers. You know, it's the most crucial step. So please, journals, editors, all of the new models, make sure you know and you're running all your conflict checks, 
You're running all the checks that you need to. There are some very different, I've seen cases of online identity taken and you have to be very careful. Please guard your online identity. Don't give your login details to somebody else because you could end up with real problems as co-author. Is misconduct in research and publication increasing? Um, it is, um, as far as we know. This is actually a live, if you go to this website, this is a live graph. If you hover over them, it'll show you the retractions, numbers, and things. So the blue line is the retractions per 100,000 publications from 1977, uh, which is the first year that PubMed actually had a retraction. The green is the number of publications. So you can see that the number as a, percent, as a proportion of the published literature in PubMed has been increasing. And last year, in this paper in PNES at the end of the year, they did a very, very extensive analysis of the papers that have been retracted. And I should say, retractions are not to be ashamed of. They are an integral part of keeping the scholarly record, record sound. And again, all the new alternative peer review models, you need to be finding out about this, you need to be correcting work that is wrong. But they, when they looked at it, um, and I'm not tired, if anyone wants to talk about how they did this and why it's come out opposite to everything that was thought before, Two-thirds were due to misconduct. Now, I stress that's a very, very small proportion. It's 0.04% of all published articles. But there is, is enormous disconnect. There's a very large survey done um, in 2002, published in Nature in 2005. These guys um, surveyed, these were NIH-funded researchers, 3,000 of them at two different career stages. 33% admitted to misbehavior in at least one of the top 10 most serious categories. These, in this top 10, were the things that were sanctionable at federal or institutional level, plagiarism, um, conflicted work, move, fabricating data, 33%. Finale did a systematic review of all the misconduct studies, and this is a very well-known one, um, hi highly cited. And they found similar figures, 2% fabrication, falsification. But what is really worrying is when you asked people which of their colleagues <coughs> was indulging in this kind of activity, 14% knew of colleagues who'd engaged in falsification. And nearly three quarters had seen other people do questionable research practices. So whatever we do at the research publication stage, whatever stage that is, whether it's immediately with lab notebooks, with, with, we have to be aware that not everything is as it seems. This is very worrying. How worried should we be? What can we do about it? I'm also on the Committee of Publication and Ethics, and one of the things we do is we try and educate people, researchers, researchers have very little training. We need to go into the universities. We need to start at school level. This is where the integrity issues need to be dealt with, so people grow up in the right sort of culture. But there's a lot about good about peer reviews. When you do surveys, researchers do value it. Two big surveys, the 2008 one from Ware and Monkman and Sense About Science 2009. And the most recent one that was published just last month from Taylor and Francis, a big open access sur survey which is really worth looking at. Rigorous peer review was rated the most important service for people who were going to be paying for an open access service. It came above r fast publication, it came above fast peer review. Again, really important. And I know, and other editors know, that in the right hands it is a very, very powerful tool. It's sophisticated, it's complex. It takes a lot of time to do it properly. It takes common sense. Um, and it takes wisdom experience because you do come across an incredible amount of things. It is a reciprocal benefit process. Um, and it also, because I'm, I'm also with Sense About Science and um, on their advisory council, and we try and get the public to understand what is good research, what is bad, how can you tell? And one of the questions is saying, has it been peer reviewed? Because that's the easiest question to ask. And people like the BBC now are actually, if you listen to their broadcast, mostly saying, work published in journal X or whatever, so people have some guidance. In the report I mentioned that I was um, involved in, um, it's a very extensive report. It's a snapshot of peer review as it was two years ago, but also moving forward to kind of models that are actually in existence. And what the conclusion came out was that peer review and scholarly publishing in one form or another is crucial to the reputation and reliability of scientific research. Because research builds on other work, and if the work you're building in on is wrong or fraudulent, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of human resources, people's projects, and you're publishing stuff that is not right. So there are new innovations in peer review. Um, 
And the one I want to, to stress, because don't underestimate the importance of the launch of PLOS One. Only s just over six years ago that the two functions of peer review were separated. There was the review for soundness, and the evaluation of interest and impact was left for after publication. And I personally believe it's totally wrong that work that is sound should not be published. That authors will go, and I've seen this happen through a whole year, People will go to nature, cell, science. They will try through the year all the other specialist journals. The work's getting reviewed. The work, they can't build on it because they're so busy still trying to write up the work. They're concentrating on it. Other people can't use it. So I personally feel all sound, that is work, all sound work that is published should be out there. And what we need is a whole new layer of other services on top of that to sift and filter, draw attention to. And if there's anyone from learned societies, you have the people. They're looking for a business model. You should be doing this sort of thing. You should have colleges of experts who, they're loyal to you. They know what the society provides. They have the experts because journals work partly by developing great relationships with the That's how you get people to review for you. The relationships you form sometimes over many, many years with people. You want them to review for you, not another journal. So very, very important. And it has grown enormously, and it has people who are copying it, which is another indicator. And when it got an impact factor that made it respectable to heads of departments, universities, it became an acceptable place to publish <coughs> besides people who philosophically felt it was an important place. And it now represents 1.4% of the world's scholarly literature. It's enormous. The trends, which are very healthy now, are moving to more transparency and greater interaction. Someone this morning mentioned the black box of peer review, and that's how the MBOJ uh, refers to it. So a lot of journals are now publishing reviews, manuscript ver versions, editorial correspondence, reviewers' names may or may not be revealed. There's a whole mix, and different journals choose what works for them. BMC series have their pre-publication history. The MBOJ journal, they have a peer review process file, anonymous. Um, BMJ Open, all these, and eLife uh, have the decision letter and the author response. And really importantly, they have DOIs. If all these had DOIs, you could use this as a credit. If you're a good reviewer, if your reviews are published, you should have a DOI. You should be able to refer to that as a body of work and your ORCID you know, so ID so that everything is there because that's just as valuable as writing a paper. You're helping other people. You're helping the scholarly field to move forward. Reviewer interaction. And I always say when I talk to, 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 to researchers, you know, it's not the editor talking down to researchers. It should be an interaction. It should be an interaction. But again, it takes more time. It takes more effort. But that's what makes a good journal. That what, that what, that's what makes a journal a part of a community, which is what, when there are journals, you need them to be. We are moving beyond that, and people are becoming much, much more important. And so that for societies who have people, I think this is something that societies could, could really do. So at eLife, they have this cross-review, and at the Embo Journal, they have a day before the decision goes out where the reviewers can actually see each other's reviews and interact. And at the Frontier series, which was bought by Nature Publishing Group recently, this is now a mat relatively mature product. They have a wonderful peer review system. They have a great system, and they are one of the few people who actually tell you on the website exactly what happens in the process. So they have reviewer, author, and editor interaction, everybody talking. But these things take effort to do, and they need somebody to oversee it. And all sorts of open peer review and evaluation. And when you have open peer review, and that covers a whole load of things, if you have people commenting, you have to know the status of those people. And I always use the example that, you know, if I've got a dentist doing root canal work on me, and he says, oh, I've just seen this wonderful paper, and it had like 100 comments, everyone, comment, you know, positive. I want to know who, who were the commented. You know, I'd rather have two experts who were also root canal experts before he starts working on me. I don't want plumbers and people saying that's comparable to art. That kind of situation puts it in perspective. Some of the new initiatives, Peer J, Peer of Science, Faculty 1000 Research, Rebecca will be talking about, Rubric. What is common about these is they are moving outside of the journal and publisher, traditional publisher system. There is a lot of space for people, and the ones that will survive will be the ones that win the hearts and the minds of the research community and provide them with the tools that they need to make their research more efficient, more effective. Uh, and there are various ways to do this. These are very early days for these new initiatives. They're dealing with very small numbers. They're going to be, will they scale up? Will people submit to them? Rubric is one that is done um, Authors pay and they get suggestions of, uh, they get a, a, a scorecard 
that is filled in, and they get recommendations for journals. Uh, PeerJ is a subscription process. But again, it's reciprocal, because not only do you pay a subscription, you also have to review a manuscript each year to be part of that. So again, it's this re reciprocity, the great value of the reviews. And there is no other profession. I'm sure if you said to accountants or somebody, can you go and do all this for free? People don't do it. But the amazing thing in scholarship is that people do. But it's built on trust. It's built on trust and honesty. And it would be very naive to think that the open access models haven't opened up the opportunity for very scholarly business ventures. And um, there are publishers being set up who are just taking researchers for a ride. And you've probably seen uh, Jeffrey Beals. He calls it the predatory journal and publisher list. I don't use the word predatory. I think it's inappropriate. I use questionable. And a lot of how do you tell who is a reputable publisher? And Marcus and Aransky, who are the two who run the retraction watchdog, they have actually suggested a journal transparency index, which would be brilliant for everybody. You put out loads of information about how you review, do you review, who reviews, who's on your editorial board, um, how do you deal with corrections, retractions, how do you deal with appeals, and that should be standard information that everyone who is publishing scholarly research has, and if you don't have it, you will be viewed with a suspicion. So I think this, this, this sort of thing should be, shouldn't be journal, it, we can have another word in there, but everybody who is publishing or having anything to do with scholarship publishing, you have to know where they're coming from. And not everyone gets this, because on Retraction Watch, this was an editor, they contacted him to ask, why was that paper retracted? And there are some publishers, some are now getting better, who, when the work is retracted, it just says re it's retracted. That is useless. You need to know what is wrong with the paper. Are parts of it right? So when they contacted him, he said, it's none of your damn business. Now, <laughs> you know, that's not the way to act. Um, so we need to get rid of that kind of attitude. Just a very quick word now at the end about ethics and integrity. Um, at COPE, we see a lot of um, problems. We help editors, journals, uh, publishers deal with cases of publication misconduct. We also have lots of guidance to help people run seminars, um, have online learning materials. Um, and there is a great lack of knowledge and training. And I know from my own experience, when you start investigating cases that look like misconduct, they're often not. Often it's a stupid mistake has been made or it's somebody else's um, fault. So it takes a lot, lot of effort. And the latest one is something that was released, re released two weeks ago, which is the COPE Ethical Guidelines for Peer Reviewers. And again, I, I, was, I was doing a workshop at a university a couple of weeks ago, and I said to the early career researchers, and there were 24 of them, how many of you have had training in peer review? And only one person put up their hand. <laughs> These people were already reviewing manuscripts. Often, it depends how good their mentor is, how good they are, you know? And, but you can't rely on that because the PIs are often not very good. So we have created, there's five pages of bulleted points at all stages on, on being approached to review, um, during review, writing the report, and journals are already incorporating it into their guidance. Stuff. But what is, what also, because this went out for a period of um, community commenting, a lot of valuable comments came back. And something we put in, which, because we're very aware that there are power struggles often, that you get early career researchers, they have a PI who is asking them to review loads and loads of manuscripts for them. And if there's any researchers in this room that's happening to you, go to these guidelines, because they will give you some ammunition. They're reviewing lots of manuscripts for them. They're not getting any acknowledgement for them. And I had a, um, an early career researcher really recently, she said that she had done 20 manuscripts for her PI without any recognition. The journal didn't know them. The journal can't run the conflict of interest things, but they also can't get the credit. They can't build up a reputation in their own right, which is absolutely crucial because that's how you get onto editorial boards. And then one also said recently that her, even her old PI is sending her manuscripts. What can she do? So what we have put in here is Peer reviewers should not involve anyone else in the review of a manuscript, including junior researchers they are mentoring, without first obtaining permission from the journal. The names of any individuals who have helped them with the review should be included with the returned review, so they are associated with the manuscript and the journal's records and can also receive due credit for their efforts, which is really, really important. So any young researchers who you have a PI that you cannot even approach about this, go to the guidelines and say, this is what COVID, and we have 8,000 members now. Most of the, a lot of the publishers have signed up all their journals. So it is a very reputable organization. They will, should take notice of it. It gives you some ammunition. So thank you.